I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you from Gimoy country, also known as Cairns, far north Queensland. And I'm delighted that you've joined me today. I'm terribly sorry that I couldn't be over in Western Australia giving you a workshop face to face because I delight in um, helping to foster the love of art and helping people be confident in their skills and have the love for art that I, I have. Um, I was very fortunate, very lucky to have a good teacher in high school um, who was a hard taskmaster and introduced me to some fundamental skills, which I've been very appreciative of um, as the years have gone on. Uh, so, uh, my art practice predominantly at the moment is centred around figurative art and I have been a part of quite a few um, portrait exhibitions in Australia. I'm absolutely delighted that this is the third year I've been honoured to be selected as a finalist for the Leicester Prize and um, I'll just have to write. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it out there right, at, right from the onset that I'm not very technical, so bear with me. I'm giving it a red hot go. Um, so hopefully on the screen in front of you, you can see on the left, uh, my final portrait of this year, which is of a Brisbane based jeweler, Margot McKinney. On the right is a portrait. The title was actually, is actually um, Mermaids Make Waves. And it's of, again, a Brisbane-based performer, Amy Shepherd, who performs in a band by the name of Shepherd. Um, here we go. It's working, I believe. The portrait that you should be looking at now is of an Adelaide-based artist and tattooist whose name is Jaya. And um, he was my finest portrait of last year and he is still presently being um, displayed I believe in the Alex Hotel in Perth as part of the portrait pathway of this year's Leicester Prize. Um, one of the highlights of my career thus far is having a portrait of Christine Anu in the permanent collection of the National Portrait Gallery in Canberra, has been for some years. So uh, I did several portraits of Christine at the time. You can see she was very pregnant with her um, daughter, her second child. So the portrait on the left is the one that's in the collection. The portrait on the right of the screen the, the three-quarter length, um, is in the personal collection of Christine herself. So because I wasn't able to attend Western Australia uh, last year, as well as this year, I put together a videoed um, drawing lesson, which you can still find on YouTube. It's pretty easy to find it. You just Google Elizabeth Barden Lester Prize on YouTube and it pops right up. So the artists that you have as finalists in the Lester Prize in any given year have got a variety of approaches and a variety of results in their approaches. Um, mine, I, I guess, is on the more traditional side, but I like to feel that my with the way that I approach my subjects and the way that I paint still has a place in contemporary figurative art and speaks of the time that we're in here and now. Because as a lot of other artists have mentioned, if you've followed through the interviews and that sort of thing, we regard ourselves as storytellers. So when I choose to uh, approach a subject to paint them, and follow through with the painting, I'm just hoping to celebrate who they are and, um, you know, celebrate the individual and, and I firmly believe in the place of art and painting people as, as a, having a place in the culture and history of here and now. 
people will always be interested in people. And as you look back, um, these are these are the things that are going to give you a sense of of the world that we're we're in here and now. So last year's drawing lesson. Um, I started back from the basics because I wanted to appeal to beginners, but I don't want you to think if you're a more accomplished artist, this is something I refer back constantly. I, there's so much to learn from revisiting the basics. And um, I'll do it as a warm up if I've been away from my studio for a while or just, you know, I'm traveling, I will always carry a sketchbook and a pencil or a pen and I'll revert back to some basic exercises. So uh, if you follow the video, you can see there is a scale at the top there, which, which has a range of tones from light to dark. And then it's applied to a simple geometric object, a sphere. But what I find magical, and I never stop finding magical about it, is essentially you're working on a two-dimensional flat surface, whether it be paper or canvas or a board, it's flat. And if you're interested in achieving a sense of realism, which I am, you can use tone primarily to create an illusion of three dimension, to create an illusion of that form popping out of the page, lifting out of that flat surface. And that to me is just the greatest thing. So let's see. Oh, I popped in this little drawing because I just said, you know, I'll always refer back to doing simple little exercises. I couldn't sleep one night. This was about 3 a.m. So I got up and I did a little drawing. That's what I do, I'm a bit crazy. Um, but you know, I'll do this on an airplane or something. I'll always go back to the basics because it just um, reinforces my skills and um, just reminds me of a few things. I often come across people who say they've always wanted to draw or they've always wanted to paint, but they didn't know how or they haven't had the opportunity to revisit it since high school or, or something similar. And my reply is usually along the lines as um, you can draw, everyone can draw if you have the desire. If you have the desire, you'll have the commitment. It's, it's no different. I'm not musical at all, but um, if you want to learn to play the piano, you've got to firstly learn the notes, learn how to read the music and do scales endlessly. doesn't matter what instrument, guitar, you've got to learn the chords. And it's going to be pretty clunky and not the greatest result until you practice and practice and practice. So if you've got the desire, you're going to practice. And the more you practice, the faster your journey will be. So the journey will be different for everybody, depending on how much time you've got to commit. But you've got to be prepared to go through the clunky stages first. Um, this is just a couple of examples of some of my other drawings. Drawing's my first love. And um, so you've got a graphite pencil drawing. I quite often just travel with a fine point black pen. I find it really handy. And I'll use a series of hatching and cross hatching to um, just to build up those tonal values. And when you're drawing, you will start usually unless you're blocking in very definite dark areas, which there's no mistake, they're going to end up as dark as they possibly can be on the tonal range. Generally, you might start with your lightest tone and build up because it's easier to build up that tone than to have to go and try and erase it in the case of a pencil or in the case of your fine point pen, you're not going to erase it. So generally, except for the very, very dark areas, which you can go ahead and block in straight away. In drawing, you start from light and move through to dark. The reason I'm so passionate about understanding how to manipulate and use your tonal values, because I think color is powerful and you're going to get there in the end. But in the journey to creating realism, the tonal values go such a long way to crafting and molding and giving the illusion of three dimensions. So quite often in my painting process at every stage, 
practically every day that I'm doing a painting at the end of the day, I'll take a black and white, I'll take a photo just on my iPhone and I'll convert it to black and white just to check that the form is reading how I want it to read, that I'm moulding that form. And in black and white, it's easier. I'll, you know, I might get overwhelmed and confused by the colour during the day, but it strips it back just to the form and how that is lifting of the two dimensional surface. So I'll look at it and I think I may have mixed a color beautifully. I've mixed the most perfect color. And when I look at it in tonal values, I'll realize it's not doing the job I want it to do in terms of molding that form. So I've got to revisit that. I'll make a, a note about it. I'll do a little diagram. <laughs> I'll work out what I need to give attention to the next day so I don't toss and turn all night over it. And that's what I'll attend to first thing the next day. Here's another example. Now, I do try and work the full tonal values, but in some cases, there's not going to be a great deal of white. There's no white in, the, in eyes. There's no white in skin tones, unless you've got a really harsh reflection of light. But even so, in that very soft colour scheme there, there are minute bits of white. On the earring, that would be an area, um, the earring that's resting on the shoulder, where I would have used pure white. And in some paintings, there's only going to be the tiniest touch of white or in other paintings, a tiny touch of the very deepest value. But as long as I've got a little bit of that value in, I'm, I'm happy. So progressing from drawing, and I would encourage you to draw often, as often as you can. Um, I just think it's a really fundamental thing before you move on to painting. And you don't have to draw with realism. And as you go along and try different experiences and maybe attend different classes or have different tutors or watch different things on uh, YouTube, you might move into a more gestural drawing, a more free, if you're doing live drawing, you've got to work much more quickly than that. So there are many, many, many skills in drawing that you can move through. But when you're ready to move to painting, I still would steer away from colour initially. Lee, you could, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting messages about the recording. <laughs> um, equally, you could make a monochromatic colour scheme with blue and white or whatever colour you're choosing. As long as you've got a very dark value and a very light value, and then you mix the range in between. So here I've tried to emulate the six values that I had shown in that drawn scale. I did this on Sunday. I was in Brisbane <laughs> until the end of the week and um, rapidly tried to put this tutorial together for you on Sunday. So these photos are a little bit blurry. Um, I'm sorry because I did take them quickly with my iPhone. But um, I did this way back in high school. I still do it now for myself. I do it for my students in the workshop. I myself have attended other professional development workshops with um, lovely artists who I admire. And pretty much in every case, we'll start with a sphere. It's a good basic thing to do to start with a simple geometric shape. You can choose your own shape. If you are more advanced, than that and you've got the time. And um, I probably should mention, I'm going to move through the explanation of these exercises in one go here quite rapidly because you've only got an hour and to try and paint along in real time isn't going to be possible. So I'm going to explain all the exercises so you have an idea of the exercises and the outcome. And then I'm going to revisit it if, because if we've got time, you're going to be able to have a go yourself. And during that time, you can also ask me questions. So, yes, I'm going to move through these slides and show you what it is I'm asking you to do. 
and you can revisit it at your leisure. Um, so if you're more advanced and you're, you're a bit sick of doing a plain sphere or a plain cube or cone, um, by all means, do set up your own still life with, you know, simple objects. It's equally a great thing. It's just going to take you more time to do. Um, so that's just an example of a simple little still life. What you're wanting to do, though, is not just have your ambient light of the room. You, you need to set up a directional light. So grab a desk lamp or, or tape up a torch or something that's going to give you a direct light source and a direct shadow. So taking that little board that I started in the previous slide, um, when you know something is the deepest value and it's not going to change, you can start with blocking in those deepest values. With drawing, I said you can start with the lightest and you can build up, build up, build up. With oil paint, which is what I'm using here, um, once you've put a certain, that black in a certain amount of that black, you don't want to be going into, you want to leave it because it's kind of, with oil paint, it's easy to make things lighter. It's really hard to get that black back if you're working wet in wet. The only way to get it back is to let that layer dry completely and then you can put the black back in. So, yep. Just as uh, I guess Sebastian Toast explained in her little um, one previously, she concentrated on uh, the very light and the very dark and she blocked in, in, the, in the darks. So then you're going to start creating your form. I'm going to put, as I said, an image up at the end, which can remind you of this form if you want to follow along and just copy what I had done. Or I said, you know, come up with your own geometric forms or your own still life, that's fine. So this is the result of the first, when you're trying to use the full tonal range. So there's going to be in some area, you're very, very white and you're very, very dark as value. And you're trying to utilize all those values in between to take what is a flat surface and give it the illusion of having the three-dimensional form in space. So that's the first exercise. Then what I want you to do, this my screen. Oh, no, go back. Um, so what I did was get a piece of paper towel and put it over the first half of those tonal values, cover up the lightest three and only leave the darkest three there to work from. And so then I produced a similar form only using those three darkest values. Now that's what we call low key. I've removed the lightest value. You would do that. You would choose to do this thing. Tonal values can have emotional value, the same as color. So this has got a different feel to it. It's, it's uh, more somber. It could have an uneasy sense because of the darkness. There would be reasons why you might want to stick to low key in your tonal values. Big surprise, the next exercise, you would cover up the darkest three of your tones and just stick to the lightest three of your tones. This is what we call high key. So again, that's a, um, you know, the feel of it, it's softer, it's more ethereal. There might be a reason that you want to use that effect with your tonal values. You, you can make an assessment of what you're trying to portray emotionally or what the, what the subject requires. And you can make a decision whether you want to use your full tonal range, your low key, your high key. That's the third exercise. So the last exercise, mm -hmm. Is what we call no I was there a compressed value range so essentially what I want you to do is not use your very lightest and not use your very darkest and just use the ones in between the middle values and that's what we call a compressed value range 
And when I show you these all together, you will see the differences in them. Curiously, when I teach beginners, beginning students, they'll often stick to a compressed um, value range. And I think it just comes from a fear of, of and a bit of nervous, yeah, a bit of nervousness and fear of, of pushing and using the full tonal range. I mean, you can make this choice. You can make all of these choices, but what I hope to do is if you practice and you gain confidence and knowledge with these um, elements and principles of art, that you have the confidence that it is a choice and not an accident and that you're able to repeat the result that you hope to achieve because it hasn't been a happy accident. It's something that you've made a conscious choice about. So here are the four exercises together. As I said, because I'm trying to achieve a sense of realism that I like things to really jump from the page and I hope that they also can read as well if they're reproduced in black and white, be it in a newspaper or, or a book or something where they haven't used full colour. So I think utilising the full range of tones that you have available to you gives you that drama, it gives you that pop. And I aspire to that every time I, I try and paint. And I had a mentor years and years ago who said to me when I was, when I thought I was finished a painting, to step back and look at it and live with it and lighten the light and darken the dark. And it might be the minutest little touch of the most lightest value and the tiniest little touch of the darkest value. But if it's there, it will help give that, um, give that the illusion of three dimensions on your flat surface. So, yeah, there might have been harder to see it individually, but together you can see um, see the difference in, in using the full range, the low key, the high key, and the compressed tones. I, Ian Goldsmith is an artist I communicate with. He's from the UK, and he popped up this the other day, and I thought that was a good little little example to include in this slideshow. Um, you can see a colour wheel on the right. You can see it reduced just to black and white and the tonal values there. And the red and the blue actually have the same tonal value. The orange and the green have the same tonal value. So um, actually I'm old enough that I used to watch black and white play school when I was growing up and I can remember the presenter saying, what color dress is Jemima wearing today? And I'm calling out red, red. And she said, that's right, children, Jemima's wearing a blue dress. <laughs> and the point of that is um, in, in tonal values, when we're using them to create the illusion of realism, and I was looking at the illusion of realism on a black and white flat TV screen, or it might have been slightly curved in those days. We didn't have flat screens. Um, I had... To me, that was real. As a young child, I had that sense of realism, whether it was a red or blue dress. When you do eventually move into using your colours, it's a whole vast universe of information to take in as well. Um, you've got the emotion of colour, the emotional... Um, the emotional attachment behind the colour red is vastly different to blue you know, we might associate red with danger or fire or blood, blue with the ocean or sky. You know, there's a vastly different effect with the emotion of colour. We can also use colour to manipulate our realism because in a general sense, warm colours advance and cool colours recede. 
so we can use them with um, knowledge and conscious choice to manipulate the depth or the illusion of depth on our flat surface, along with a whole bunch of other things. Um, it's such a learning process and I'm going to be a student for the rest of my life. I'm going to keep soaking it all up and learning and watching and observing and hopefully learning for as long as I'm on the earth because, you know, I'm a lifelong student. There's always so much more to learn. I love it. So um, I just put up some images from some student workshops that I've run from time to time up here in Cairns. Once you know how to manipulate your tonal values, you might have seen if you've watched process videos or, or people on Instagram or, you know, you follow different artists, that it, that it is a technique. It's not the only technique. There's so many different ways to approach starting painting and finishing there's so many different processes but it is a technique that you can do a tonal underpainting so this is the next slide that I took these students through and you'll recognize in the middle the um, still life set up there with the jug the watermelon and the orange because that was from that workshop so these guys did do tonal underpaintings they could choose to do it with you know a burnt umber or with with black um, it was just an exercise. It wasn't meant to be a finished painting. And once they'd established the tonal areas, then they started to build up the colour. And I think this next one is also an example. And again, because it was a student workshop and people came with, they were at different levels. So the results that they had at the end of the weekend were very different as well because they brought with them prior knowledge or, you know, some people could work much more rapidly. So um, that was that. And, oh, here's another one, <laughs> a little curious. You know, I always take little curious things along. I live in Kes, so I have a lot of shells at my disposal. I often take a lot of shells. I didn't expect a student to put the shell on top of the butter that we were using at lunchtime, but hey. So, um, there was a tonal underpainting that happened with that one and then the colour started to be applied. Now, none of these were ever taken to the finish level. These were just exercises. It wasn't the point of, um, we, we, we then went on to one that they spent longer time with. These were exercises so they could get in the groove. Oh, that's just my business card. You can contact me that way. Um, now we're at the stage where I'm going to pop up. The, I just went back to that, um, the little full tonal range thing. If you wanted to have a go at um, doing some painting yourself, if you've got any time left. I, I have sat, this was my, um, this is from the video that I did last year for the Leicester Prize. I always hang on to my resources because they come in handy for other workshops that I teach. So I hang on to them. And this was uh, the little board. These are the little boards that um, that I did on on the weekend to put this together for you. I had to be a bit tricky. Some of them are a little. They're a little bit um, still wet. Yeah, so I'm actually at the stage, Adeline, if you could unmute and I'm open to any questions from our participants today. Adeline. <laughs> I see I've got a little chat box here. I'll open it up. Someone said the slideshow is not working. I hope I haven't spent all this time talking and it hasn't been working. Hi, that was me, Alex. It, uh, it was, it was me that was not tech savvy 
I, it was perfect. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for letting me know, Alex, because it could have been me, because honestly, no, no. I'm not technical whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I've really enjoyed um, the workshop so far. It's Great. been fabulous. So thank you. Great. Well, um, if any of you were prepared and had your pencils or paints ready to go, I'd love for you to follow through. As I said, I just wanted you had to be sick of listening to my voice while I went through it because I think it was good to give you an idea. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if I tried to do it step by step, some of you would have been faster or slower. And I also would have had to figure out how to do a camera looking down, which I really couldn't do. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> okay, I've, I've got some um, uh, comments coming through. I'd love to hear a little more about using colours in painting and getting the correct tone. So tricky. Hi, I'm watching from Auckland, New Zealand. Great workshop. Thanks so much for doing this. You're welcome. I'm actually, I couldn't do it in New Zealand <laughs> maybe one day soon we hope um I'm in Queensland so our waters are gonna be a little bit slower there uh, I'm so sorry I couldn't do it in person in WA but I tell you if the border opens I'll be there I promise <laughs> I'm coming um do I do a tonal underpainting um I I don't these days do a full tonal underpainting um, unless it's something so tricky I'm worried about losing, losing my way and I might put more attention into it. These days I kind of do a half one. So I will always start with sort of a tonal underpainting but I'm probably quite loose with it, just enough that I can get started because uh, once I start a painting, I'm totally immersed and you just um, don't want to be around and wanting my attention for anything else because I don't care, I'm just going to be painting. Um, so, yes, I will. And usually I don't start with black and white. I will start with a burnt umber because I'm mm. using skin tones. Um, so if I start with the burnt umber, usually that's going to be somewhere somewhere in my finished painting and in starting with the darker tones usually your shadows and your darker tones tones do end up the thinnest part of your painting the thinnest layer because you don't have to revisit them whereas the lighter tones you're sort of building up building up building up now i don't use thick layers of paint i don't work thickly um, if you're able to visit the Lester Prize, you'll see a vast difference in my painting technique to, say, Avid Plow. Um, he works um, with a thicker application of paint. I use very, very thin layers of paint, but lots of them, and I, I build it up. Um, so you, you really do want your lightest values or your lightest hues and colour to be the final thing that you're building up to. And in some ways, if you did work with a thicker application of paint, it's almost sculptural because you're working from the shadows which are receding back up to the lightest tone. So, yeah, if you are someone who needs to paint more thickly, you'll get even a sculptural effect with that. Um, going back to Vivian, who said she'd like to hear a little bit about using colours. Um, for this workshop, um, A, I was put in the last minute <laughs> because Sebastian was meant to do a continuation and explain how she uses a corn palette and she wasn't able, so I put in the last minute. Um, but secondly, because I did establish that little video last year, I thought I would do a continuation on from drawing with tone into painting with tone. And I know that there are going to be people like your lovely Western Australian artist Desiree Crossing, who's going to um, explain a little bit more about mixing skin tones and the like. Um, and I think there's somebody else that's going to delve into the world of colour. So I wanted to just follow on from drawing a tone into painting with tone because I think that's the bridging step. And um, it's something that I believe you can 
start to practice as a beginner, but even if you're more advanced, just give yourself a more advanced subject matter, but still do this exercise because going back to the basics is never wrong. And I do it all the time. And as I said, I've done workshops with Angus McDonald, James Guppy, Robin Ely. They are all artists that I admire very much. And usually any workshop that I do will very first revisit tonal values and use it as a warm up, basically. But my philosophy on colour, and I say this to the students who come to me that I make, I make them start with drawing and drawing a lot first, then we move to painting tonal values, then we go to colour. To me, it's like, you've got to understand a whole lot of things. You can't, as I said, you can't just go from learning the scales on the piano to paint, playing in a concert hall. And I also draw the comparison to if you're baking a cake and you're given full access to the pantry, but you don't understand how ingredients work together and you're just throwing things in without knowledge of how they work together or proportions or even what temperature, you know, part of the process, you're probably not going to come up with something very successful. And if you do come up with something successful, it's been luck. It's been a happy accident. And if you try and do it again, <coughs> you're probably not going to be able to repeat it. So my point is in learning these strong foundations is that you are going to be able to understand what you're using together, why you're using it, the processes, and you're going to come up with a result that hopefully is pleasing and that you can repeat. So, um, using colours in painting and getting the correct tones, <laughs> um, you'll get there. It's just, as I said, it's it's a desire to do it and a commitment. Practice makes perfect. Um, you're so lucky when I was, I grew up in Brisbane um, and there was no YouTube or internet or Zoom. And the Queensland, the Queensland Art Gallery that exists now at South Bank only came into being whilst I think I was in my second year of university. So I didn't even have exposure to be able to physically visit paintings in, in big art galleries and museums. My knowledge came initially through um, just visiting libraries and looking in books. And I can remember a, a small privately owned gallery in Brisbane had a visiting impressionist um, exhibition. And I had only seen these works in books. And I can remember being terribly disappointed because the ones that came were postcard sized and I envisaged them to be these grand paintings. But it made sense because um, the Impressionists would go and paint plein air. So they'd pack this up in their little backpack and go trudging up the hills. And they'd do these little, little paintings. But at the time, I didn't understand that. So you've got a wealth of resources available to you these days. And um, if you've got the desire and the commitment, you're going, to, you're going to find a lot of information. And especially, as I said, I know Desiree is going to follow with some colour mixing and that sort of thing. Anything else, guys? Yeah. Who's painting? Me. Great. Me. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> We've got about another 15 minutes and I'm happy to shut up and let you paint and love to see what you, um, what you produce by the end. Um, otherwise, if you have any questions at all, I'm here ready and available. I'm surprised my two dogs haven't come in and joined. I've got two beautiful mm -hmm. colleagues. <laughs> one's black and white, one's brown and white. So 
see what I can see some lots of concentration. Uh, Sasha, yes. Um, I just, you don't have to use that sphere. I've just put that up as a simple example and an easy one for you to use for the exercise. Um, I might hold this up because I'm not going to revisit the whole thing. Uh, but what we're doing, um, if you mix up a range of tonal values, and I, I mixed up six, I mean, you can have many more than that. So in this example, I painted, which is the one up on the screen, I painted using the full range of tonal values available to me. So there's going to be, in some areas, the very lightest value and in some areas, the very, very darkest value. The next one I said to do was to cover up the first three lightest values and only use the three darkest values. Let's see if I can hold that a bit closer. Okay, so only use the three darkest values, and that's what we call a low key tonal range because you're not using the three lightest values, and it creates a completely different mood and effect. One that I don't use very often because I don't paint dark and moody. I've tried it. I've decided it's not me. I like to live in the light and the colour. It might have something to do with the fact that I live in Cairns and I'm surrounded by light and colour. Um, but it's just what I choose to do. Um, the other exercise up here is the other end of the tonal value scale. So you cover up you cover up your three darkest values and you only paint with the three lightest values. And lastly, you cover up the, the very lightest value and the very darkest value and you just use the middle ones. And so from the same set of paints that you've mixed up and the same subject, you've come up with four very, very different results. Understanding these means you can make a choice. Are you trying to paint something which has a very somber and dark meaning to the painting? They're in shadows. Maybe it's, it's got a heavy subject matter. You might want to use this low key effect. Are you painting something that's a bit more dreamlike and soft? You might want to stick to this and stick away, steer away from your darkest values. And equally, that's a different effect that you might want to employ. It's, it's just an exercise that after I put my students through lots of drawing first and then moving on to paint, this is what I would always start with. Actually, probably the last workshop I did attend was a couple of years ago was Robin, Robin Ely's and he, he and I think an artist called Tom Herman <laughs> put together these cute little boxes for each student and had a little torch coming in the side for our directional light. And um, that was cute, but often I'll just, I'll just set up a desk lamp. Um, I did meet Desiree Crossing at that um, workshop, which was in Adelaide. And I also met Jaya, who is the subject of the portrait, the guy with the tattoos and the glasses, who um, was my finalist entry last year. I met him there as well. Angie, can I talk a bit about my process when starting a portrait painting? Some of the previous questions about using photos and also do you work from drawings of the sitter? Do I use colour, charcoal, pencil, paint at these early stages? I always have a live sitting. I won't use other people's photos at all. I, I like to... Um, a, you're getting into a minefield of um, 
creative ownership and copyright if you're using somebody else's photos. But I've always just taken my own because you can then have a bit of control about the direction of it, how you would like your sitter to be something. You might have a preconceived idea and um, once you're there, you've got to change on the spot because it's not working. I always react to the sitter and the situation. And again, um, beauty these days, which I didn't have the advantage of years ago, um, you've got digital cameras, you can take thousands of photos and it doesn't matter, you're not working with film. Um, with regard to, yes, I always have a live sitting, but often my sitter doesn't live in Cairns. I've travelled to them. My studio is in Cairns. So, of course, I take reference photos to come home and paint with. Um, drawings, yeah, I... I, I often will, but not always, because depending on who the sitter is, um, it's a luxury to be given a lot of time and very, you, do, you know, it's a complete luxury to be able to have someone sit with you for the duration of a painting. And COVID has made that even harder. But um, just noting that I, I am based in Cairns, Far North Queensland, and I often travel to Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne to my sitters, and they're often um, people who can't give me a lot of time. So I take whatever time I, I, I can get. And if I do have time to do the sketches, um, Pencil is my preferred thing, only because in that situation, only because. Um, I could get a bit messy with charcoal and sometimes I'm in, you know, their private spaces and I, I don't I don't want to be doing that. So yeah, I'm quite fond of my pencils. Um, bye Bindi, thanks for joining us. Uh, Joe, do I manipulate the light for the live sitting? Um, only if it's an interior situation. In most cases, um, I will try to use natural light because I'm not a good photographer at all. So it's just, I'm thankful I can paint because <laughs> I don't take good photos. And, um, but the thing is, you can give the same photo to 10 different artists and you will get 10 different results. We will all approach it differently because our processes are different. What we, our idea of, beauty or our idea of the finished product is vastly different so you're never going to come up with the same result even if it's the exact same photo unless you were doing a workshop where people were being led step by step um, so as i said i'm an awful photographer i don't know anything about lighting really in terms of photography so i try and utilize natural light as much as possible and i find um, find it to be really flattering with, with the skin tones, flattering for the person. But at the end of the day, you're painting. So you make choices and you manipulate your, your paint. A uh, good example of that is my finest piece, which is in this year, Margot McKinney. And I did talk about this in um, the interview that I did last week. I was actually away in Brisbane and, and did it down there. But... Um, the background colour, the green, is it wasn't something that I would have chosen per se. Green, it's it's not a colour that I would choose or that emerald green, but it was very specific to that sitter because that was her workplace, that was her jewellery emporium. And it was important as part of her character, as part of her story. I, I could have chosen to give her a different background, but I wanted to include it as part of her story because people in Brisbane know her emporium because, because of that colour. And um, I had to manipulate that and just choose one area to have it as the true hue of that emerald green, but elsewhere I had to play with it make it dark, make it bluer, different things, so that it achieved, um, you know, the contrast against different edges that I wanted it to do. So that's what you do. You have a starting point and, and you take it from there.
Thank you, everybody who's leaving and saying that you enjoyed it. I appreciate it. I will say, um, these little boards, I always have scraps. I paint on Belgian linen and I always have scraps left over and I can't throw them out because it's Belgian linen. So I will take them and glue them onto cardboard and just use them for student exercises or give them to my student for exercises because, um, so I just use, I just use aqua, they're not, they're not meant to be a finished painting, they're just exercises. So I will just um, paint the cardboard with acrid here glue and you know put it under some I had another heavy board and create these little boards just for playing with. What inspires me to choose my subjects? Um, so originally when I started, um, I'm an absolute people watcher for starters, um, but originally when I started choosing subjects, I really wanted to champion the achievers from my region. So I chose Christine Anu, who actually is from Torres Strait Islands, but she did her schooling here in Cairns, so she has quite the connection. Um, one of her teachers was a, a friend of mine. Um, I painted Brian Robinson, who again is from Torres Strait Island and very accomplished artist up here. And if you've ever visited Cairns and seen the Saltwater Lagoon, which is built on our esplanade, there's um, three fish, stainless steel fish sculptures arising out of that. And they are the work of Brian Robinson. And he his portrait was the first time that I was in the Portuguese Memorial Art Award. Um, been hung six times now in that one. Um, I painted uh, Dr. Dawn Casey, who is also an, a, an Indigenous woman from this region who's done wonderful things. Um, Rosella Namok, who is um, a Lockhart River artist, Indigenous artist. So I really tried to champion the achievers from my region. Um, as time went on, I had to look further afield and it's kind of it's it's kind of odd it can be the most random um and serendipitous event um for example uh i painted genevieve chang who um I was just, I was in Brisbane and I was listening to the ABC radio, I was driving with my mother to the ABC radio on and there was an interview about the book that she'd written called The Good Girl of Chinatown and just listening to the story and the book, she, it, it's, it, it's a autobiography but it encompassed generations of her family something about that story just intrigued me so I reached out and approached her, she lived in Sydney um, I can't actually remember how Margot popped up, but I'm pretty sure she popped up into my Instagram feed with because things do, because you're interested in something and Siri listens. And um, she had this jewelry campaign. The photographs are on her website and they're just glorious. Um, where she had her models and her stunning jewelry, but they were with you know, exotic birds and animals and creatures. And the campaign captivated me because I, I didn't know about her jewellery. But once that popped up, I researched who she was and more about her jewellery. So that connected me to Margot because I wanted, I wanted the, the campaign was just so incredible and exotic. It attracted me to knowing more about her jewellery and who she was as a person. Um, Jaya, as I said, I connected with at um, an art workshop I went to myself in Adelaide and 
poor Jaya was behind me and I kept stepping back and into his easel and having to apologize. But um, he just he just intrigued me as a person as well, getting to know him across that workshop. And uh, I, I asked, would he be my subject? Trying to think, Amy Shepherd. Um, again, um, I have strong connection to Brisbane still. Um, all of my family, two of my three children live there now. And uh, Amy is a very big part of Brisbane and she's just sort of striking with that colour hair and um, a real mermaid. And mm. she was coming to light with this campaign about body positivity and I was really drawn, drawn to that, that she was a young performer who was using her platform to promote this body positivity and she, she made a statement, I got the title, she made a statement somewhere along the line that mermaids make waves, not ripples, which was concerning um, that she was going to speak out and not go quietly into the night. Then we have, um, oh, hello from South Africa. That's incredible. Thank you, Mia. Um, Jaguar, who I've painted, if you've looked at my Instagram or website, um, Jaguar Johns is her performing name. Her name's actually Dina Lynch. And again, she's a Brisbane-based performer. And um, she's getting, um, she's just been nominated for an award with Triple J Radio. And that's something she's really using her um, platform for advocacy for change within the music industry against some really negative and nasty elements that are there. So um, I just choose my subjects because I think that they are an individual that I want to celebrate and I want their story to be known. Who's brave enough to show me what they're doing? <laughs> Great. Thank you for showing me. I don't know your name, young man, but thank you. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Um, Black Hat, you'll have to hold yours up a bit higher, please. Great, fabulous. And yes, pink headband. I'm oh, sorry, I can't see your names with this. Okay, so you're using um, charcoal or pastel for yours? Great. As I said, an hour was never going to be long enough to get through these exercises, but um, you know what to do. And I believe this has been recorded, so you'll be able to play it through and play it back. Um, and hope you love what you do. I love what I do. I love um, spreading the joy of it and demystifying it because I think everybody should be able to enjoy it in some way. If you have the desire, you should enjoy it in some way. Thank you for inspiring me. It's been wonderful to break up my day with you and to, uh, wow, such a calibre of um, talent. So thank you. Thank you very much. Are you in WA? I am in WA, yes. Well, yes. hopefully I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. If I do, I'll um, just come and put some random workshop on in the coffee shop in front of the gallery. <laughs> Gosh, that'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. I watched. I, I was so hopeful. I was watching every day to see if our rules change. I could have actually come if I self-isolated for two weeks over there. And again, so that was a whole month of my life gone <laughs> yeah it's big it's 
self-portrait on the cards. Now that's a that's a good question, curious question. Um, it's a funny thing. <laughs> I guess I'm like, I don't know, I might, you might call me a social introvert. I love people. I love teaching. I love interacting with you. I don't particularly like being on camera here. So I don't particularly like being the subject of things. Um, so um, I should do a self-portrait. I have done them from time to time, but they don't ever see the light of day in the public eye. Um, again, it's very valuable exercise and I probably should revisit it. I'm just quite busy. I've, I've pretty much got my work cut out for me through to the end of next year. So with other things. So trying to slot it in and make the time, but um, like most things that you should do, I should find time for it one day. And that's why when I paint other people, um, I just take it as a, as a complete honour because it comes with a trust and responsibility. These people have been kind enough to agree to let me paint them. And, you know, maybe they have some reservation about it, but they, they hand it over to me. So that comes with a tremendous trust and responsibility. And I really do try and honour the people that I paint and celebrate them and, you know, just get their stories out there. But a much has been made also in the fact that we're um, telling the stories of individuals. We also then highlight, especially if you go and visit the exhibition as a whole, we're just highlighting what connects us as well as a community, as humanity, because, you know, you see, you see the ties that bind us and, and, and you recognise, I remember years ago I had a solo exhibition, oh, here's one of my puppies, um, solo exhibition, and a lady from America bought my painting because a figure in it reminded her, <laughs> reminded her of someone in her life in a real nostalgic way. Um, so we just, we recognise things in other people as well. Thank you so much for your lovely comments as well. I'm seeing that I'm not reading them all out. <laughs> I, um, you've just given me a gorgeous idea, um, Elizabeth. I have a portrait uh, a collective one which has many 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 people in it and I haven't started because I'm so scared <laughs> I'm so scared of failing <laughs> I'm so scared no, of, the, no, of every, no, no. everything that's around don't know, be scared it's like planet, a planet. <laughs> but um it's going to be quite big and I think that um you've just reminded me that you know perhaps putting them up in little you know little packages on small pieces of linen um, might get me to the bigger piece. So. Yeah, and don't be Thank scared. You. And you can even do that with the bigger piece. Break it up into tasks that you're going to achieve one at a time. I do. I, I can get overwhelmed mm. by it and I'll go, okay, I've, been, I've gotten a bit lost on the face, so leave it and concentrate on the hair. Just the hair, focus on the hair. So I'll break it down. I don't, I'm not someone, and as I said, there's lots of different processes and heaps of ways to bake a cake. And mm -hmm. some of us like carrot cake and some of us like sponge cake. So, but some people do work in a grid format. I don't, but when they do that, you can very much break it down to an area. Mm -hmm. I'm not that um, clinic. I'm not, I'm not clinical, I'm not, I don't break it down to a grid, but I do break it down to tasks that I can achieve that need to be achieved and, and I might just focus on, on that one at that time. I'm someone who, once I have achieved the form of it, the format and the composition and the form, and I start applying colour, 
Um, I'm actually someone who has to put down local colour in just about every area. Not everybody does that. Some people can leave the canvas and work systematically. I guess I'm just not systematic. Um, <laughs> But I have to put a sense of local colour, even if it's just a really light wash of that colour, um, because I just have to put the jigsaw puzzle together. Um, mm. So I might put a light wash of a suggestion of a skin tone. Mm. To me, again, um, I like to draw lots of analogies. Um, it's like maybe but it's not thick it's very thin it's like putting down a, a hint of yeah a foundation before you could ever get to the blush or the eyeshadow <laughs> so mm -hmm. as far as the last thing you know so I've got to put down just and I just did it yesterday um eventually I, I, you'll see a painting but I'm doing a painting that's a lot more colorful than I have done in quite a while um and it's quite a um, the, the clothing is is quite a pattern, and I could get so lost in it. So I had to I had to just put a little bit of color in in all the areas just so I didn't get lost in it. Mm. Do you work? Do you work on? Um a stretch canvas from the outset or do you um I do later and I stretch them myself yeah oh okay and I often have to re-stretch them tighten Ooh. them during the process I'm a bit naughty I don't always use a mild stick <laughs> mm. I was going to say the fear of failure that reminded me of the story. That portrait that I showed you of Christine, I know that's in the National Portrait Gallery. When I was painting that, I had a girlfriend coming over visiting regularly. Um, and she came in this day, she said, how's the painting going? And I had a cloth, I had a rag thrown in a cloth. And um, I said, I've stuffed it up. She said, you can't have done. I said, yeah, no, I really have. Mm -hmm. And she lifted up the cloth and she said, yeah, you have. Oh. <laughs> Which I appreciate because you don't want dishonest friends. You want, mm -hmm. if she had said to me, oh, no, it's all right, I probably mm -hmm. would have, you know, I would have said, no, you're not telling me the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, she told me the truth. Um, but I'd gone so far in that piece that I had to rescue it. I had to make it work. And must have because it's in the National Water Guide. So it's just paint. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Do you know what? It's because I've never shown any of my work. I'm in a studio here and I've blurred out the background so no one can see my work. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Just that... Um, well, that's a, I mean, that's a thing. Um, 